So we have got ourselves an AEW Civil War. So we had a big video to kick off Dynamite and the BCC were talking about their stuff. And the good guys now want to fight back. When we cut to John Moxley in the desert, who <laughs> was talking about being a caterpillar. I mean, why wouldn't you do that? There is nuance to this as well, though, because we also saw Orange Cassidy, who is struggling with all of this, as Jonathan promised us that he's doing it for the greater good. I mean, that's what you would say. You're directly responsible. We then came out of this vignette to see all the AW baby faces in the parking lot with a bunch of weapons because they were going to jump the Backball Combat Club. And I'll just tell you this, coming close, they did a really terrible job. I do like the overriding arc to all of this, though, because it feels like it's going somewhere big. And hello, my friends. Welcome to Ups and Downs, the only wrestling review show you need. And of course, today we shall be going through AEW Dynamite because that was the last show on wrestling television. I mean, how else are we going to do this? Do you want me to review it on, like, November the 10th? That would make no sense. Let's up those doubts. How do we kick off the show proper too? With very angry man, Hangman Adam Page. Tony Schiavone was doing the interviewing too. And man, he didn't give a flub. Because he was like, oh, hi, cowboy. Why don't we talk about the fact you lost to Jay White? And Adam looked at him like, man, I will rip that hair off your head. Page then grabbed the microphone and made it very clear he doesn't care about any of that. Because look at the Bang Bang Gang. He has taken all of them out when he didn't mean to dinner. And he whooped Austin Guns' his ass so bad, he can't even remember what his brother is called. That must have tied into Wrestling Rule 14.8 because Colton Gunn was here. And he did the worst job ever. This is like hiring a plumber and they start to fix your walls. Like, man, just fix the toilet, damn it. Because he dove at Hangman. He missed, and he went flying over Barry Barricade. Page was then going to choke him when Jay White and the rest of his buddies made the save. Although the hangman was limping here, and that is definitely going to tie into the story. Everybody kept talking about it. White was the same because he was all like, <laughs> look at old Larry Limp over here. But you need to calm down, dude, because I beat you once, and I'll beat you again. He also said we should take a quick look at the banner, which does read All Elite Wrestling, because whereas the cowboy likes violence and stabbing people in the face and using cinder blocks, Jay White is the greatest professional wrestler to ever walk this earth. So basically this isn't done. I'm sure they'll have another match at full gear. Although given the lay of the land, it does kind of feel like Hangman Adam Page needs a crew of his own. But who the flub would be stupid enough to team with that guy? He'll probably kill you. It's nice to see AEW guys who feel like AEW guys in the AEW feud. Sometimes that's all I want from AEW. Hashtag AEW. Up. When we do have to give kudos to this company, because they have done a great job with Shelton Benjamin. And to me, it feels very much the same as when Christian Cage arrived, because that guy never got his due. He needed somebody to give his due. He finally got his due, and now it feels the same with Shelton. He is like a certified badass. We also got this video beforehand because he was going to be taking on Sammy Guevara. He was all like, man, wrestling's all about moments. When he marched to the ring, and his moment was getting his ass kicked. I mean, the first thing Benjamin did was just launch him into next week, although Sammy was able to get a dive, and he even followed up with a moonsault to the outside. And that rhymed, so it must have been correct. He was then going to carry on, but I think MVP must have made a noise, because Sammy Guevara just looked at him when Shelton grabbed this guy and just pushed him right into the stage. Once again, I was just like, <laughs> Sheldon Benjamin is really good. It was basically Suplex City after this as well, because Benjamin hit every single one of those. But during that, I think Guevara must have become aware of this, and he kind of trapped Sheldon. That's how he was able to get back into it. Sammy then wanted to go for another dive, but he got caught with another suplex. But by this point, he knew to land on his feet when he was able to hit a cutter. <laughs> Shelton Benjamin kicked out at one. Boy, howdy, do I like this. Sam then wanted a springboard, but that was a terrible idea. <laughs> Because Shelton Benjamin never forgets. And as he was flying through the air, Benjamin just super kicked him. And it was like 20 years ago all over again. He then hit another one before getting the T-bone for the one, two, three. And I just enjoy this so damn much. Because you know that Bobby Lashley is going to be in there too. And the Hurt Business or the Pain Clinic or whatever you want to call them. They just work. They worked in WWE. They are going to work here. And we're taking our time. There's no rush, man. At the moment, we're building Shelton Benjamin. And I presume his match against swerve is gonna be damn good i am giving it up brandy paquette was then with mariah may and she had stolen anna jay's suitcase so there it is crime counter she threw it down the hallway because of course she doesn't think that anna jay belongs in aew and this was a physical way to represent that but anna must have been watching this from literally behind the camera because all of a sudden she was here and she whooped mariah may crispy daniels tried to break this up and of course they're going to have a match Given this feud did come out of nowhere, 
be honest with you, I actually think it's all right. When we got to a very important moment in AEW, because Kyle Fletcher, who recently turned heel, was coming to the ring, and he was going to cut his big promo, letting us know why he hates William Ospreay. Because if you want to be a big time heel, you need to talk the talk. Listen, when Kyle walked to the ring, he was getting booed, so he achieved step one. When he was all like, I don't care if you do, Jekyll me, I only want to talk to one singular person. And oddly, he was talking about his cousin Gary. Of course he wasn't. He instantly insinuated that William is in a very bad place right now as he does have a bunch of slipped discs as he got hit with the Tiger Driver. And then also wanted to talk about the fact that Carl Fletcher was already in AEW when Will went and turned up. Because before that happened, everybody was saying that Carl Fletcher was the next big thing, but then they all turned their attentions to Osprey. And instead the conversation became, oh, Carl is just like Will Osprey. He even sounds like him. And he called them all stupid Americans because they can't even recognize a brand new accent. He also thinks he's way better. And let's go back to 2021 when these guys did start the United Empire. Osprey was a totally different guy then because he had the killer instinct. I like to think he was talking about the game. But as soon as he got into New Japan, he was able to stab Okada right in the back because he didn't care. And look what happened with Kenny Omega. As soon as people started to go, ha ha, Ken's way better than Will Osprey. What did Will do? He did indeed get that screwdriver and he tried to kill him. So what has Carl Fletcher been trying to do? He's been trying to kill Will Ospreay with the screwdriver. So turn around is fair play. So essentially Carl is now following in his footsteps thanks to Don Callis who keeps telling him you shouldn't worry about what Will Ospreay is doing. And in fact, you should basically kill him. It also just means that Fletcher is now going to fulfill his potential as Ospreay never wanted as he dared Will to come out of the hospital or check himself out of the local medical facility so he can whoop his butt and send him back there. It's like, man, that's gonna be a lot of travel. It also means Fletcher can then become the star he was always destined to. And because he wants to be nothing like Will, Don Callis then passed him a razor and he shaved his head. I was like, well, one, that's a super cool visual. And two, welcome to the brotherhood, my friend. You are most welcome. So I just thought he totally hit this out the park. And the interesting thing is he does need to beat Will Ospreay next week or in two weeks, whatever the hell they're fighting. And I'm not sure that's going to happen, but it does mean the match has jeopardy. But again, if somebody had said to Carl Fletcher beforehand, you have to go out there and do a good job, he totally achieved it. Just to totally ruin his heat as well, when I started to do my own wrestling, Carl Fletcher was one of the first guys who was super duper nice to me backstage, and I've never forgotten about it. So when you do see someone succeeding, and you remember how kind they were to you before, it just makes you feel warm and fuzzy in your tum-tum. But now forget that, and let's pretend he came up to me, and he punched me in my bald face. Boo, boo, we don't like you. We are most definitely giving him an up. This was real good. We then got footage from Maple Leaf Pro Wrestling that happened over the weekend. You should go watch that show because it's damn good. And also on there, it was Takeshita versus Josh Alexander for the international title. It's basically a match of the year contender. Ricochet had made the save on that show though, which is why Rene Paquette was now talking to him. It's like, well, I did tell you, any place, any time, Takeshita, I'm gonna own you. This is mostly because twice he has been totally screwed out of the international title, even though he never loses a match. When he told Takeshita, why don't you come to Rampage, or anybody can come to Rampage, because I'm really pissed off. I don't see that coming. I then popped massively because MVP walked in, and not only did he basically reference the past, because of course they were in WWE, but he gave Ricochet the magical business card. Now listen, not everyone is going to sign up to this group, but I love the fact we're teasing it. Once again, it really is my favorite thing in the company right now. When Brian Cage and Lance Arch won a tag team match, I mean, this went about eight seconds, and it was so quick, I don't think we were even told who their opponents were. It ended with this massive choke slam power bomb thing as well. And look, two massive dudes running wild and slapping man meat. It is never going to get it down, ever, unless they kind of lay on the floor and play checkers. But even then, I would find a way to enjoy it because they're just so jacked. It's getting it up. At the same time, this was so out of nowhere. It came and went so quickly. I don't think it really established them as a team because of course they're going to be super duper dominant. And actually what I thought would have been better here was a promo or at least an explanation about why they teamed up to begin with. Because I mean, they're totally believable already as killers. But at the moment, they're just friends, I guess because they do a lot of bicep curls. Now listen, let me make this clear. I am very excited about this team. One day I think they should be the tag team champions. But this was the time to do a little bit more. And we didn't. I just have to give it a down. I was a bit disappointed. When we went back to the good guy AEW crew, who was still waiting for the BCC, 
I was like, guys, just go home. You look like mugs. Chuck Taylor, who is now acting as a backstage agent, even have to go tell the conglomeration, uh, by the way, it's Mark Briscoe's match now. But this was going to tie in because he saw Orange Cassidy. He was like, listen, dude, do you remember when we had no money and we had to live together? We are friends. Therefore, he knows how tough Orange is deep down in his tum-tum. That's why he needs to rise up and take on the Blackpool Combat Club. This is essentially Star Wars. It's also going to tie into the ending of Dynamite. We'll get there. I really do like it, though, because I think Orange Cassidy should have always been given a go in this position. And we even did a video on this years ago. Now, in terms of the timeline I set out there, I'm totally off. But you know the deal. Better never late. When controversy reigned supreme, because it was a ladder war for the Ring of Honor World title, as Chris Jericho battled Mark Briscoe. I'm just going to tell you this, it was absolutely brutal. I mean, almost instantly, Briscoe just threw a ladder right into Jericho's head and he slammed him through a bunch of tables. And I got my fictional watch out. I was like, man, we haven't even gone 10 seconds. Jericho then did a suplex on the floor and basically hit Mark with a piece of a table when we just had all of the carnage. And yet Mark Briscoe was laying there just bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. I mean, there really was a lot of blood. This was mostly because a ladder had been chucked into his face, but then they were grabbing each other and doing DVDs off ladders into tables when more projectiles went into people's skulls. So listen, given this just happened on a random television show on a Wednesday night, you do have to give them loads of respect. They were giving us everything. Briscoe at one point also just threw himself off the ladder and crushed Chris Jericho, whose head kind of fell into another table piece. I don't think that was planned. When out came Brian Keith. I was like, Brian, why have you waited so long? I don't think there's a disqualification in a ladder match, but I presume that Rocky Romero is now Batman because he stopped Brian and he did it with the magical kendo stick. You just knew the biggest of Bills was going to appear soon and actually we timed this well because Mark Briscoe had hit the J-Driller, so he was about to win... When, of course, Billy Boy did come out, not only did he hit him with a choke slam, but he hurled them through these tables and they just exploded. I was like, man, Mark, you are the greatest babyface ever because you will just do anything. He also then quite literally put Jericho on his shoulders and because he is so tall, moved him up the ladder. And yep, Christopher grabbed that ROH title and he's now the brand new champion. And if you went really quiet... You could hear the internet melt down. Now they started to celebrate when from nowhere Ishii's music played and out walked the New Japan legend and fair play to Chris Jericho. He was like, I just went through a battle, man. I don't want anything to do with you. And he legged it. Now let's have the conversation. Because I really do find this hard to criticize because once again, they gave us so much effort. And if all of a sudden we're about to learn that Ring of Honor does have a TV deal something, I totally understand why you would make Chris Jericho the champion. Also, if we get to final battle in a few weeks and Mark Briscoe whips his ass and wins the belt back, well, I actually think that's going to be quite satisfying. And also here, I was so mad that Mark did lose his title. And that's the whole point. The heel pissed me off. So again, when I throw that into a little package, I am going to give it an up. I found myself invested. Amazingly, though, Ishii was my issue here, which is the name of my brand new diss track. Now, there's nothing against him because that guy is all time. But he came out so fast in order to set up the new feud. I was like, man, you didn't even give me two minutes to be sad for Mark Briscoe. I want to be emotional right now. I mean, it really was a bit like here's a new challenger instantly. Who pressed start on controller two? So it's nothing major, but I am going to give it a down because it was just the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't mind Ishii helping out, but just do it next week. When? Well, I was surprised. I can't lie. But Adam Cole was here for story time when he did get interrupted by Adam. Because out came Roderick Strong with the Undisputed Kingdom. I was like, wait a minute. I thought he left them for dust. What is going on? Now, he wanted to talk about MGF because Maxwell had used the Adam Cole brand in order to try and win himself over with the fans. When deep down, we all know that Maxwell Jacob Friedman is out of scum. He didn't even check on Adam when he did get hurt. But do you know who did? The Undisputed Kingdom. Because they didn't form in order to try and stop MJF. They are together because they are the best of friends. I was like, one minute, I got something in my seeing device. Mike Bennett made that clear too because they started this together so they have to finish it together. When Matt Taver was like, some of the best times of my life were when we were a bunch of buddies running around the place. I was like, well, isn't this just nice to see? They're also super proud of Adam Cole because he came back from this injury. And yeah, we should all feel that way. Just go and read about it. That poor guy went through everything. Then the big twist is that he wants to face MGF before Adam Cole, which is when very handily Maxwell did turn up on the big screen. He was having a massage. 
What a weird time to film a video. You also had an offer to make though, because even though last week he had said that he will never face Adam Cole, now he knows that Roderick is interested, he will set this gambit. They have to win three matches in a row, and whoever does that first can take on MJF at full gear or something. Now this all did get quite complicated when Friedman also made a hand job joke. Don't get mad at me. That's what he did. I am just the messenger. So I suppose the idea here is that Cole and Strong may actually fall out after all because they do want to win three matches first. When we also cut to the back, Kyle O'Reilly was there. He was just looking like a sad panda. Now we need to talk about this week because when you throw everything into the blender, this is so hard to retcon because there were so many unfortunate errors, not even errors, just unfortunate incidences that did happen when we were trying to do this, that now when we are back on track, it is going to be a little bit bizarre. And once again, the best part is that everyone is going to be okay because again, as Cole talked about this week, he needed somebody else's bone put into his foot. So just give that man all the sympathy. However, the thing is, I don't think putting the Undisputed Kingdom back together after we kind of got rid of it last week is the best idea. Mostly because I'm worried they're gonna turn on Adam Cole. Like I basically watched this whole segment going, well, I don't believe these chiefs and Adam, you shouldn't either. So this really didn't hit me in the way that I think it was intended. And it's just too complicated, which means I have become Avril Devine. And now I'm starting to think maybe we should have just gone, or oh, it is gonna be MJF versus Adam Cole at full gear because they hate each other. So just to make it super duper clear, I am very happy for Adam Cole, but this has become, well, it's just two plus two equals potato, right? It's got to get it down. So look, it is just too much. And sometimes I think when we've already walked through the woods, you should just keep it nice and simple. Then I had a good video with Penelope Ford who said she hates Jamie Hater because she's been out for two years. Whereas Jamie just comes back and gets everything handed to her on a silver platter. When we did cut to Hater with Rennie Paquette who went, that's not true. In fact, in the past, I had to wrestle in front of 20 drunk men. Like, well, we've all been there. This match goes down in two weeks. And again, actually, if you do watch all the AEW shows and you put the pieces together, this too is all right. It's just a shame that you kind of have to do a puzzle to figure it out. Either way, they are going to fight. I look forward to it. When, and you have to forgive me, I had to write their names down because they came and went so fast. Kevin Coa, Jaden Monray, and Piotr Della Murte, who has a much better name than me, and I can't pronounce, got absolutely absolutely murdered by the House of Black. I mean, this was another squash and essentially Malachi hit his big kick and Buddy Murphy was stomping on people's skulls when Brody King was running through people when they broke somebody else's head. One, two, three. Buddy then grabbed the mic afterwards though and was all like, hey, I just heard that a certain somebody has been cleared, so I'm going to face him next week. He was talking about Adam Cole. What? Cole went and found him after this too and Murphy told him, listen, dude, I want to take you on because you are fragile. I couldn't help it. This is what my tum-tum did. I was like, well, why don't we do the Undisputed Kingdom versus the House of Black? I think that would be really good. And listen, we just some planted some major seeds. They're not going to do that, though. And it just left me with this overriding thought, which was, what exactly are we doing with the House of Black? I mean, sometimes they're not even on the show and they come and do this, which is really cool but it never actually goes anywhere. I'm also not a fan of having two squash matches on the same program, because I think you do get to the law of diminishing returns. And once again, the House of Black is super duper cool. If you knocked on my door right now and said, Simon, do you want to watch Adam Cole versus Buddy Murphy? I'd be like, you bet your ass I do. But all of this just feels too quick. And once again, it just feels a little bit confusing. So maybe I'm an idiot, which I am. But I think you could have done more here and we didn't. It's got to get it down. I suppose it just feels like a missed opportunity for the first match back, but they're still totally cooked. As did Camille versus Queen Aminata, and I know there were a few squiffy bits in this, but I don't care about that. They are just humans, and ultimately, I thought it was a damn good showcase all round. Of course, Camille is a massive powerhouse here, which she needs to be, as she continues to be the intimidating friend of Mercedes Monet who was at ringside, just being an absolute asshole. And I know, she creates quite the conversation online. I think Mercedes is great. Aminara then came back with all the pins because she understands how to win a wrestling match when she got absolutely wrecked with this backbreaker. I was like, wow, Camille, you have so much strength. Aminara then came back with this death elbow too and Camille sold it like, oh my gosh, she may have knocked me out. So yeah. I thought these two had good chemistry. I'd watch them fight again. Aminara then applied this gnarly submission to the point Camille almost used the most devastating move in all of sports and attempted to surprise Rob to get the one, two, three. But when she went for a power bomb, the queen reversed that one into a surprise pin of her own, and she almost, almost won. 
but she didn't. We really did give Queen Aminata something though, because she kicked out of the torture rack spinning slam thingamajig, and everybody stole that like, how did you do it? When Camille hit this spinning neck breaker thing, and I saw some people online saying they didn't like that. I did. It looked like absolute death. I'm a fan. It also makes sense because you can't fight without a neck. And of course, Mercedes Monet got in there instantly and they were going to beat her up when finally Chris Statlander came to the ring. We are getting into this feud. She got in Camille's face at first because they are going to have the big fight next week. So of course, Monet attacked her from behind. And just when Chris was about to murder both of them, well, it's the numbers game. You can't keep up with that. So Camille hit that net breaker thing again. And for the second time, I think it looks good. I still find it weird that Chris Statlander is a good guy again because it just came from nowhere. But once more, if you came into my life in 2024 and said, do you want to see these two matches? My answer would be yes. And in terms of some content on a wrestling show, I actually enjoyed this quite a lot. We should do some on Queen Aminata. She's really good. Uh, we were then back outside with our would-be heroes. They were just yelling at people in cars. It's like, that's your big plan? You better come up with something better. Sadly for them, it was Christian Cage and the patriarchy when Kip Sabi was hanging around too. So Christian Cage chased him off and they went all the way to the ring. When we cut to Hook, who was talking to Rene Paquette, he said, yes, I do know who kicked my dad's ass. And they're in the ring right now. So I'll go to the ring and I'll beat them up. This was a lot. Now, it also meant the attacker was either Christian Cage, Kip Sabian, Nick Wayne, or Shane Wayne. I was like, oh my gosh, please be the latter. But I presume it must be Christian, because after Hook took out Nick Wayne, he went right after the fake daddy. This is when he got totally nuts, because Kip Sabian smashed Hook right in the penis. So he's now friends with Christian. And Cage also went up to Kip and said, I know why you stopped me cashing in my contract a couple of weeks ago. But we'll talk about it later. Go and stand in the corner. So Kip Sabin has now become a punished child. Nick was then back trying to hit Wayne's well, but instead Hook got the red run, but he too got done by the numbers game. And Christian Cage got involved when he dropped Hook on that case, briefcase kind of a thing with the kill switch. So Hook was dead. And then it got interesting too, because Cage got right in his face and said something like, this isn't what you think it is, before he walked off. I was like, what the hell does that mean? So we're not meant to know, even though Hook most definitely knew. And I think here we have to have Hook say, Christian and Cage attacked my pappy, so now I'm going to get revenge. But it does leave me in a very strange position. So on the one hand, everything Christian does is brilliant. So I do want to see, so I shall give that an up. But the execution here, once again, just a little bit weird. And I felt like my brain was trying to catch up with what is happening on the screen. But I'm sure in hindsight, we can retroactively look back and say it is okay. That part is getting it down, which kind of sums up my feelings for this dynamite. There was some really good stuff, but it was always followed by a... Well, I just feel like I'm a little bit lost. When we got to our main event, which was the private party and Daniel Garcia taking on the Elite. And listen, the good guys won. Correct move. It also meant that our last match was our party match. I'm never going to get mad at that because I always enjoy it. And Daniel Garcia and Jack Perry paired off and the Young Bucks and Private Party paired off, which makes all the sense in the world. That's the feud. So you ain't got all the double clotheslines and all the kip-ups, because why wouldn't you do that? When he <laughs> saw the AEW crew still in the parking lot. And I was like, dudes, one of you stay there and the rest of you can all get a drink. And then someone can text you going, oh no, here they come. Matthew and Nicholas then got on top here because they were using double teaming when we saw Stokely Hathaway yelling at Private Party. And even the commentators here were like, oh man, Stokes doesn't know what to do because he's lost all of his clients. So surely that has to be a story. Daniel then almost got the hot tag, but he was cut off by Jack Perry, who basically murked him using Timmy the timekeeper's table. But do not worry, nobody checked on him when he was on the floor. So eventually he took a Phoenix down and he was good to go again. It meant that Mark Quinn could get the hot tag instead and he was running wild for a while when he also tagged in Isaiah Cassidy and he too was kicking ass. So Private Party were able to have their like two minute showcase. They hit some Poison Runners, which has just become the move of 2024 because wrestlers totally love it, which is when Garcia got back in the thing. But actually his presence must have caused a distraction because the Young Bucks going to hit the TK driver when Private Party stopped that. And from nowhere, they hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment surprise roll up and they beat them they just defeated the champs Cassidy then got on the mic instantly and said haha this proves we do have your number so we're calling it in right now we want our tag team title rematch now I got excited because again Isaiah did say we've got your number I hoped he meant it literally they were just going to give them a bunch of prank calls. I mean, it would be annoying. The Young Bucks weren't interested at all when Isaiah sweetened the pot because he was like, fine, we've got a stipulation for you. If we do try and we fail, Private Party 
we'll break up. And Mark Quinn looked at him like, wait a minute, we haven't discussed this. So maybe some badness is coming. Matthew and Nicholas were totally into this too, so we've made the match for next week. And I can't lie, I'm going to say it again, it's become my catchphrase. This was just too quick. Like when we set this up seven days ago, I thought private party throughout the end of the year were going to be having matches with random teams and almost being beaten and then winning. And then we could emotionally invest in them because you're like, oh my gosh, they almost had to break up. But instead, within 14 days, we're doing it again. It just feels too quick. So that made me a bit of a sad panda because I thought there was real longevity in this. So yes, I am going to give it a down. But when it comes to the match, never stop doing this. I love the craziness. I love the you go, I go, we all go. It's a really hard thing to pull off. Give it up. It also meant our closing segment was going to be with the Blackpool Combat Club because finally they turned up at the building. So somebody should find them because they were super late. But it turned out to be a big old ruse because while Marina Shafir was in the truck, it meant the rest of the BCC rushed the ring. Pat Cloudy and Wheelie, you were also smashed at everyone with chairs when John Moxie walked to the ring dragging Chuck Taylor. So let's just get it done now. We're going to put on the one, the crime counter, especially because they then put Chucky T in the ring, wrapped a chair around his neck, plastic moly, stood on it, so he's dead. The whole point, though, is that finally the good guys rushed to the ring, and I was like, where have you been? You were looking for the Blackpool Combat Club the whole evening, but Orange Cassidy took a knee by his former best friend, well, he's still his best friend, but again, he may have been murdered, and he looks super sad, so you can see what we're doing here. We are going to turn Orange Cassidy into a serious contender, and I like it. There was more to this as well, because do you know who was watching on the whole time like a bunch of cowards, because they did nothing? It is the Elite. So yeah, this is something you can actually swim through. It has some proper depth. So I do think the angle is working. And once again, we are taking our time with this. And we're just sort of like adding bits as we do go. So I shall give it an up. I really do want to see where it's going to go. Which brought us to the end of AEW Dynamite. And I've kind of already given you my thoughts. There was some really good stuff. But a lot of it did end with your brain going, hang on a minute. <laughs> a little bit confused. And that could be me. It was still an enjoyable two hours of television. But maybe it just needs a teeny bit of tightening. Still going to give it an up. Now, of course, please do leave me a comment below and let me know what you thought about the show. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Click the video on the screen, which is me upping and downing some more wrestling shows so you can get even madder about my opinions. That's just the relationship we have, and I treasure that, man. See you soon.